to what is it? Four trillion the last lunchtime talk of the year. Uh, this, yeah, this year, this semester. There will be another full slate of lunchtime talks this coming spring. The schedule will be posted all all the bulletin boards in this building sometime around the beginning of uh, next semester. Uh, today's talk is going to be given by Dr. Rob Benson of our very own Earth Science Institute. Yes, very good. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much for coming today. I always appreciate the turnout that we get at these things. And I'm going to plunge you into darkness. Is that OK? Oh, OK. Well, this is very interesting stuff for me. Uh, see if I can get it to move. Uh, the things I'd like to talk a little bit today about are, you know, why, why, why do we have a touch table in a museum? I mean, it's kind of a, a strange sort of a concept. Came out of a whole variety of different things, and this is probably part of it. Um, this is a very famous quote by a very famous individual, and there's one right in front of us. Do we know what that is? Well, we can, you know, go up and look at it, and we can measure all kinds of different sorts of things, and you know, for a, quite a while, you can, you know, it was difficult to get beyond just simply the physical appearance of it, and now we have all kinds of advanced analytical techniques, but really, where is that thing from? I mean, it's beautiful, isn't it? And I brought a heavy one intentionally so that no one would try and lift it. <laughs> and I mean lift it like in the pocket and gone. Uh, but. I mean, there's always a lot more to the story. So really, the idea is to get this thing beyond just some simple museum display. And I'll be talking more about the Ryan Museum in just a moment here. And the thing that's particularly, particularly neat about, you know, I can look at minerals and think, wow, they're cool. And I can look at fossils and think, wow, they're cool. And all my students nod their heads and say, wow, they're cool, just so they get good grades. <laughs> uh, and but still, we can go so much more than that. And how do you get them off of the shelf and into the, uh, the context of where they came from? I mean, their native habitat. Uh, that's a little more challenging. So this kind of goes along with another, another very important thing to all of us. It's, it's the idea of inquiry-based learning. We can look and ask questions. We can look and think about different kinds of things you know, with regards to where did that mineral come from? What's the context of it? What are the other minerals associated with it? What kind of fossil do we have? What, does it say about the environment? Uh, so that's all inquiry-based stuff, and this is a wonderful tool. So the idea is that maybe we can actually use the touch table and this neato technology in the museum setting to actually reach out and get into a virtual setting where we're actually out there looking as best as we can. So here's the museum. Uh, this is a very warped view of the museum. This is done with the ever you ever uh, found Apple iPhone. Uh, this is a panorama done with Photosynth. And you can tell that it's not exactly perfect, but it certainly gives you a good idea of the perspective of what the museum's about. We have 5,000 specimens in here. That's a bunch. And for many, many years, uh, Ed Ryan would come and visit, and he would look at something and say, that's not in the right place and say, yes, sir, okay, we'll fix that right away. And every year he would come back and say, that's not in the right place, in a different area. So this gives you an idea of what the layout is of the museum. We have everything on shelves. We have a relatively static, well-lit display. But parked in the center is the touch table, and that's what I am standing in front of right now. So what's, what's the next step? How do you get things out into the field? Uh, any, can anybody figure out why this was taken or how this was taken? That is correct. <laughs> and when was oh, it taken? Oh, as summer. Yes. And can you even figure out time of day? About uh, 11. Well, it was actually at lunchtime because those are my boots, and I am sitting down enjoying lunch. <laughs> it's very important to do geology effectively. So <laughs> the thing that's really cool is that, yes, that's geology, yes, this is the Arkansas River, yes, this is a very uh, fondly remembered field area for some of my students, uh, where everything is vertical and nothing is horizontal. And there's a little kind of a dragon's tooth or dragon's back ridge along through here. And 
Right up in this area, one of our former students, Lyle Carbett, discovered trilobite tracks. Devonian age trilobite tracks. Okay, now that's cool, isn't it? Uh, but trilobites are little, you know, creepy crawly things that lived a long time ago. But here they are in this scenario. Using a touch table now, we can actually zoom in and look at geology and so forth and try and get a better feel for what's going on. So, as far as the background goes, I think at this point, this is pretty obvious. We can take the museum collection and we can expand it out and reach out to a lot more people. And the thing that's nice about it, too, is that it's like when I took physics. Sorry, Dr. Benz. Uh, it was terrifying. Anybody identify with that? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I was very shy about asking questions about physics sorts of things. So I would prefer to go and talk to my buddies and people I trusted instead of going to the prof so I wouldn't look stupid. Okay? What's nice about the touch table is that this thing is, this thing is non-judgmental. I mean, you don't, you don't have to be scared of this thing. You can ask all the questions you want and nobody's keeping track. One of the reasons we were able to get this uh, was through a Title V grant, and this is very, very much appreciated. And we also got a little bit of support from ASU in the museum. I was funded for a sabbatical for the spring semester of last year, and I was able to do a lot of this work. Really, what does that mean? I was on sabbatical. I was a museum hermit. It was wonderful. I got to live in there. I also had another opportunity to reach out and collaborate a little bit with Dr. Matt Schilt over in the music department. And that piece that you heard playing before I started uh, was a piece that he composed specifically for the museum, uh, inspired by and written for the museum. It's called Aurora Nova. So when you see him, I'm, I'm sorry that he's not here. He's going to try and break loose from another session. But uh, you know, compliment him on it if you, if you liked it. Uh, and he's got several other ones that he's working on. One has more Celtic themes to it, which I'm looking forward to hearing. Okay, so as far as the technology goes here, and this is, this is always kind of the boring stuff, I think, is that this is what it is. This thing that I am standing next to is an Ideum touch table. They have lots of different kinds of these things. This thing weighs about 100 pounds or so. Uh, and it has a pretty hefty bunch of computing stuff inside of it. Uh, it has a couple of terabytes of storage in it. Uh, it's got an HDMI interface with it, and it clearly has some sort of interface that I can touch. Now, I'm not using any remotes here. I'm using just fingertips on this whole thing, which is really kind of nice, except that, and I, I've slipped into this bad pun several times, the touch table is very touchy. Uh, <laughs> it's not very forgiving. Now, for those of you who may use uh, tablet devices and so forth, you'll really appreciate this. But think about all your simplest little slips and mistakes on a touch table being magnified just because it's big. Not on a touch table, but on a tablet. Just being magnified because it's big. So in other words, the little wiggle that you might have in your index finger turns into something really huge on this thing. So that's a problem, but it's not bad. Uh, I'm using another problem called Windows 8. Uh, <laughs> which is not really a problem, it's just really very different. Uh, and so that's been an experience. And we use a fair amount of inquiry software. Now notice how the inquiry is in quotes. Some people might argue that all software is inquiry based because you have to sit down with it and figure it out, right? Uh, the <laughs> principal one that I've used uh, for bringing data in is good old Google Earth, and you'll see a demonstration of that one here in a minute. There's another one that we also have in the planetarium, the full dome format, which is spectacular. If you have, have a chance to see that stuff, please go over there and take advantage of it. But this one's called the layered earth. Uh, Dr. Stalas likes to refer to the layered earth as Google Earth on steroids. <laughs> uh, and of course, like all high-powered things, it also has some issues with being too fancy uh, and being, um, having too much stuff. And then, Kind of the nice familiar standby that we're all very familiar with around here is good old ArcGIS. Uh, this is good old GIS software, which is uh, able to import a lot of different kinds of information in a spatial context, and we can manipulate it and do all kinds of things. So that's the inquiry software. 
But there are also some other things that are somewhat miscellaneous. Uh, you know, just little things like there's a Microsoft Planet, which gives you some different sorts of views. There are some different kinds of touch interfaces. There is a uh, underlying touch interface on this particular table called Gesture Works. I won't tell you what gesture it doesn't understand. <laughs> uh, but so there are all kinds of different little things that you can use. So like all good uh, issues with, with developing new ideas and so forth is that, you know, I had this great vision of being able to take a sample, okay, and just sort of have it morph into where it came from and get everybody all fired up about it and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and like all good visions, do you always realize the vision, 100% of what vision version one <coughs> was? I mean, things always get modified and tweaked as you go along. So I'm going to talk real briefly about some of the successes and not successes that I had. Uh, big success was data entry because I was able to use, surprisingly, for all this fancy stuff, a very, very basic software called Excel. All right, now how many specimens did I describe in the museum? A heck of a lot of specimens. And each one of those specimens has about between 20 and 30 fields associated with it. Okay? So I was able to get all that to a point where I could use it. And you'll see some of those coming up here in a minute in a, in a real-world context. So, oh, see, here's a problem with touchiness. You see what I just did? Isn't that cool? Now you're seeing PowerPoint in its ugly, gnarly side. Uh, you can't get too enthusiastic with a touch table. And some of the problems I had on the bad side were the graphic details. How to get things to look the way I wanted them to look. That was, that was a challenge, and I still haven't realized all that. I had quite a bit of success with cross-platform things, being able to take files uh, from one package and move them to another. The big crux here uh, was something called KML. That may mean something to some of you, but the fancy word, the expression, the, it's an abbreviation for Keystone Markup Language, uh, it's the underlying software that runs Google Earth. Now, Google Earth isn't the only one that uses it, but uh, there are a number of different, different uh, things you can do with KML. So by using KML formats and its uh, compressed cousin, KMZ, uh, I was able to move a lot of stuff around from different sorts of uh, software things. Now, you'll see that the, I have cross-platform under swearing as well. <laughs> uh, the big brother of KML is something called XML. <laughs> uh, sorry to throw around all the lingo and stuff. Uh, but KML is not as detailed as XML in some cases. And doing apparently simple things required some pretty serious translation effort on my part. Uh, there were no Rosetta Stones associated with some of these things. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, are conversant in this thing called hexadecimal. It just sounds cryptic and nasty for me. Uh, some of you are conversant in it. Uh, but I had to switch back and forth doing program things every once in a while to get the cross-platform going. So, as far as successes go, back to the good things, I, I'm pretty pleased with how things have gone. Uh, I have an excellent basis. Now, whenever you see excellent start together, you start getting a little suspicious. <laughs> like, nice job, but uh, I'm very, very happy with where I got in uh, just a few months. And it's very definitely a work in progress. Uh, where the swearing will probably come in is continuing to incorporate our teaching collections into this touch table because I've only talked about the museum at this point and the museum specimens. We have a lot more stuff, and I want to get all that incorporated in, into this touch table at some point. A big success has been the collaboration, and it hasn't been just with Dr. Schilt on the music, but I've talked to quite a few other people, and we've had a lot of, a lot of fun getting this thing going. Continuity will be a problem because continuity is just a hard thing to keep going sometimes. Uh, I have a number of different students coming and going all the time. Uh, 
you know, I have to work on different projects at different times. I can't devote full time to this. Uh, if there were administrators here, I could probably leverage, uh, hey, just give me a full time job in the museum and I'll be happy and I can do all these wonderful things and I can really realize the vision. Okay, what would, the, what would such an administrator say to me? Yeah, right. <laughs> you can't work on what's fun for you all the time. But one of the nice things about this whole package is that it is pretty darn robust. It's hard to screw it up. I can get pretty good results pretty easily. However, when it comes to uh, making things really, really customized, it's a little trickier. Things are very, very complex in terms of trying to tweak like what symbols look like, what rotations look like, and zooming into particular areas, and just dealing with simple things like, where are you? Uh, for people who are very familiar with uh, GPS units and so forth, uh, there are different kinds of you know, datums and coordinate systems and all, and they don't necessarily always connect back and forth between different data sets. So, this of course is always the really big question. Does this stuff actually do what it's supposed to do? Uh, so just as kind of an example, here's, a, here's one of our uh, specimen, specimens that we have. These are brachiopods. These are marginifera. Uh, they effectively look like clams or scallops, although they aren't exactly that. Uh, these particular guys are Pennsylvanian in age. Uh, okay, so. You should be thinking, okay, great, it's Pennsylvania age, marginifera, they're brachiopods that look like clams or scallops, okay, big deal. Uh, where do clams live today? Yeah, they're marine critters. And uh, so, okay, they must have lived in the ocean at some time, in the Pennsylvania, but they're from Colorado. Okay, well, maybe things will stir up a little bit more here as we go along. They came from shelf 15 right here in the museum. This is just a general location uh, museum. Uh, this is where the touch table normally resides. So, taking the inquiry part, let's see if uh, this will actually work. Okay, now you're all thinking, uh-oh, the black screen. <laughs> it's not gonna work. Well, remember I said 5,000 specimens. Uh, there's a heck of a lot of data in here, and it's taking a little bit of time loading things up. And you can see where it's loading a KML file right now. Isn't this fun? How many people get distracted at this point if they play with Google Earth? <laughs> the biggest problem I have in the museum is that, you know, we get people coming in and what do they want to do? They want to find their house. <laughs> is that okay? Absolutely. Absolutely it's okay. Uh, so, I think we all know where we are at this point, right? This is the USA. Uh, see, I'm already getting a little touchy here. Uh, those are the uh, mineral and fossil locations in the museum. Let me get these on. That, that, that really helps, doesn't it? That's just clear as mud. Okay, well, let's zoom in a little bit here on this thing. And all I'm doing is just standard sorts of swipe uh, kinds of measure, uh, movements. A little better, huh? That's kind of gross looking, isn't it? <laughs> it's okay, you can be honest. <laughs> so you can adjust the transparency a little bit, and automating all this stuff is getting to be a little bit tricky. Does that help at all? Anybody recognize where we are? Oops, sorry. And if you haven't figured it out, there's a hint in the middle. <laughs> now, if we were to go way over onto this side, there's some interesting things here. To bring this guy up. And how come my guy is not appearing? Yeah, exactly. This is the swearing part. Uh, we'll just layer it. Hmm. Due to technical difficulties that I warned you about, 
You can see where the minerals are, but I'm disappointed that my fossils are not appearing. Let's zoom out for a further look. Well, is there anything suspicious about how these mineral locations are? <laughs> this is one of the problems. See, I'm trying to distract you from the other problem while I think <laughs> about the fossils. Uh, the, the collection is very well documented, except for one thing. Anchorite from Colorado. Colorado's a big state, isn't it? And I don't have any specific locality information. And this is one of the things that work is being done on to try and narrow down the locations of these guys in a little more uh, detail. I mean, really, these are just alphabetical going up in this direction. And they're in a nice 45 degree line. Uh, the reason I settled on this is that if they're all centered on a line originating in the middle of Colorado, then they're from Colorado. Uh, right now, these are just approximate locations. I have them in the right state with the best data I have so far. So, for instance, we'll look at this guy and see what happens. You may notice that it has an approximate map status on it. It's got all kinds of different, you know, various keep, keep things organized kinds of stuff. But look at this down here. It's actually actual descriptive information about what's going on. And if I want to find out more about it, I can go to this website. And sure enough, if you want to be a geek, this is your place. <laughs> we can zoom in on a particular, ooh, like that, how to buy silver. Uh, that's an example of this particular mineral. Is that cool? Let me try fossils one more time. I don't know why that is not appearing. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you to sort of envision something. Anybody see where the La Vida Pass Road is yet? See where Fort Garland is there in the middle? comes up and around in this general direction. Uh, well, up in this area, right about here, there's a really cool outcrop with brachiopods in it. They're Pennsylvanian in age. Some of you have been there. Some of you have collected them, and probably some of you have thrown a few of them out. Uh, OK, so kind of keep that in mind, what that location is, because we're going to go to something different now with um, <coughs> our software. We're going to go to layered earth. <coughs> now you're probably thinking the same thing. It's not working. Actually, this is working. Uh, this one also has a huge amount of information <coughs> within it. And I'll see if I can pull the fossils up on this one, and I'll illustrate another problem. Aren't those cute? They look pretty, but they're not very effective for communicating anything other than the location. So, we'll zoom back into this area. They look like nice little stacks, don't they? See those things called brachiopods? And layered earth, unfortunately, for a variety of reasons that I have not thoroughly ascertained, uh, doesn't have really good uh, data display information. It's hard for me to pull up stuff in here, so I typically tend to do that more on Google Earth. So that at least give you an idea of the fossil distribution that we have, and the same problem with names is occurring here. Fossils are oriented north-south, but effectively all these fossils are from the same state, and they're just all stacked up there. That's something that's just going to have to get resolved. The way we're going to do that is by looking at, okay, this particular bracket.
Acupod is from this particular member of this formation, will adjust the position in Google Earth or Layered Earth and make it a better representation of where it's actually from. So now we're going to go to the Pennsylvanian. Now some of you may be wondering what the Pennsylvanian is. That is today. Isn't that a good thing? It looks sort of like it should for today. <laughs> and you can see that we have North America on there, the equator, the Arctic Circle, uh, and so forth. So, you know, I think we're in good shape. Now, where was that brachiopod? Do you remember? Can you sort of zoom in on where it is? Can you think about it? I'll give you a hint. There's one in the middle already that gives you a hint. Denver. Now you're probably thinking, gosh, this is pixel hell. <laughs> uh, well, part of it is, these are paleo maps of what the continents looked like at the particular time they're assigned to. This is present day. It looks very similar <coughs> to today, but it's not really super detailed. So you might think of that brachypod <coughs> as having lived uh, and died right about in this area on the paleo map. So we're going to look at something else now with regards to plate tectonics. Notice that now over on the sidebar here, I have a whole lot of geological ages there. So we'll just step back through these. We'll jump back into the Pleistocene, which wasn't that long ago. What's different? Yeah, we have a lot of ice. and. When all that moisture gets sucked up into glaciers and ice and so forth, what happens to sea level? Drops. Okay, how many of you have seen the day after tomorrow? <laughs> now, do you know why I usually call science BS on that? Yeah, they have glaciation, the whole country freezes, and somehow sea level rises. What's wrong with this Hollywood version? <laughs> okay, anyway, it's, a, it's an opportunity for critical thinking. Uh, okay, let's go back even further into the Miocene. Woohoo, what happened this time? Anybody see that little wiggle of the coastlines? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go back even further into the Miocene. Things are getting even better. Wow, we're drifting. Okay, this is back into what's called the, affectionately called the KT boundary, where there was a major meteorite impact right up in this part of the world. Uh, and this is where, you know, I bashed Hollywood just a second ago. Well, I will give them some credit for this one. Uh, in the movie Armageddon, most of the movie I thought was BS, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> they had a little sort of a lead-in, like background thing, which showed a bolide, a meteor, hitting the Earth. And they did a pretty good job of showing what that might have been like. So they do get credit for that. Uh, okay, well, things are happily migrating along here. Life is good. Wait a second. What happened here? See that little uh, incursion of water up here? Look at it now. Okay, what was Colorado like back in the Cretaceous? Yeah, things were wet. Uh, okay, we're, we're starting to have an issue here. What is that issue, everybody? It's not a tech issue. <laughs> What's happening to the continents? Well, they're get, kind of getting out of sight, so we'll just zoom around this way. Uh, what happened to the Atlantic? Yeah, we don't have much of an Atlantic left. Okay, going back further into the Mesozoic. Uh, hmm. What's going on here? Okay, how many people have been, been able to keep the brachiopod location in front of you? <laughs> it's a little trickier, isn't it? It's a little trickier. Now, a brachiopod is what kind of life form again? This thing that looks like a you know, scallop, right? It's marine. It likes you know, warm water and likes water in general. Well, let me tell you, that at this time, dead brachiopod is about there. So, we'll go back into the Permian a little further. <coughs> Early Permian, and finally, 
we'll arrive in the Pennsylvanian. Okay, where was that brachiopod? Right here, happy on the equator. Times have changed, haven't they? <laughs> so the really, really cool thing about this kind of stuff is that it is possible to sit down and ask inquiry-based questions about something as simple as, hey, we've got a brachiopod, great. That's a cool dead thing in the museum. Uh, and you move on. But now, you see the difference? It's possible to ask a question about this particular brachiopod and actually go in and think, oh, well, Colorado, a brachiopod, it's marine. How does that work? Well, it's 300 million years old or so. And you can wind the clock back, so to speak, to actually figure out perhaps, you know, what were the conditions that that brachiopod lived under? Underwater, fortunately. Anybody have any questions about this stuff so far? <coughs> MA stands for million years. Uh, well, I don't want to disrupt the presentation too much by doing a demo of what they actually do, uh, <laughs> but I will give you one little, I will simulate hair, which for me is a challenge. Uh, okay, I'm holding my a lanyard out here, okay? Imagine a young lady with long hair going in and just leaning over the museum and going, wow, this is cool. <laughs> wow, what's happening? I don't know, I'm not even touching it. It's like, oh, excuse me, ma'am, it's your hair. Oh, sorry. So training is an issue. And then when you get 10 little kids coming in and they all want to touch the touch table, what are you going to tell them? Don't touch the touch table? Uh, and you know, sometimes things can get a little confusing and so forth. So it takes a little bit of guidance uh, from them. Usually what ends up happening with, with kids is that I'll try and get some sort of show together that's all automated. And I'll give you an example of one of those right now. Uh, and this is, I don't want to say animated per se, but this is one that Dr. Beaton did. Uh, this one has to do with glaciers. Welcome to the glaciers. <laughs> you know what's neat about this? You can go wow for sure. <laughs> but do you notice anything about, I mean, we always talk about glaciers being rivers of ice. But it's like, wow, I want to go over here. Or I want to look at it at a different angle. How's that? Or you could actually stroll up the glacier in some cases. Look at all these moraines and stuff. You can actually start asking questions and perhaps coming up with some answers and start looking at landforms. And you can continue to get out and get even bigger and bigger pictures of the whole scenario. The McKinley Range doesn't look quite so bad, does it? Alaska looks fairly minuscule from some views. <coughs> Another thing that's really fun to do with this thing in terms of inquiry and all, I've added a bunch of dots. Anybody notice anything about this? Is that on the Ring of Fire? Yeah, the Ring of Fire, that famous Johnny Cash song. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's not that one. Uh, <laughs> that other one. Well, those colored dots aren't exactly on the surface, are they? Now, if those little red dots and yellow dots and green dots relate to earthquakes, uh, why are we complaining about them in California? Because look at the uh, Pacific, the west side of the Pacific. From a tectonic point of view, every one of those earthquakes, for the most part, I shouldn't say every one, you never do that in geology, uh, but those are all on subduction zones or plate boundaries of some kind. And the colors relate to the depths. Reds are shallow, yellows are intermediate, and the greens are deep. So Europe is relatively benign in the earthquake world. You'll see that there's one green one orbiting right through the, uh, 
uh, Gibraltar area now. For the most part, things are fairly, fairly calm. The good old Californias, I mean, you know, the problem there is the earthquakes are very close to the surface, but there aren't too many. If you go down to South America, notice how there's a kind of a pattern to those. As you go eastward, they get deeper. Now, if you don't believe me still, you can zoom in on this whole area. And I can tilt things. No, I don't want to do look at any of that. <coughs> Does that make a little more sense? The South American plate is moving westward and is colliding with uh, part of the Pacific plate, and the Pacific plate is losing. The oceanic crust is being subducted and pushed downwards, and of course all that friction and grinding is producing earthquakes. Uh, and just as long as they're deep, they aren't too bad, but it was a fairly serious one down near Chile not too long ago. Uh, in fact, the largest recorded earthquake in history occurred in Chile in 1960. I think it was a 9.4. Uh, that's also why we have volcanoes and so forth all the way along um, the coast. I mean, all kinds of neat stuff you can see through here. Now, where are we going? That's right. Now we're headed up to San Andreas. What happened to the shallowness of the uh, earthquakes? They all got shallow, didn't they? You don't have any subduction zones here. Do, I ha do we have any volcanoes? Not in Hollywood, in Southern California? <laughs> no, we don't. Uh, as we go further north, though, what starts happening? Do we start seeing volcanoes again? Yes. Yeah, now subduction's not too outrageous in this part of the world. Uh, there's a little tiny plate that's starting to go away. And let me see if I can go ahead and put the arrows on here. Well, I'll put the plates on there for you. How come they're not showing? Because I have to key the map. This is geology superimposed. Just one little tiny plate left behind up in this part of the world. Okay, now how many people at this point are wondering, how did we get so far off the museum topic? Because now it's kind of digressed into show and tell with what I can do with the touch table, right? Mm -hmm. You'll probably agree with that. But think about the context now, like being able to bring in museum specimens and actually find out more about what's going on in a particular area. We have all kinds of specimens of ropey material from a place called Hawaii. So we could jump over to Hawaii. And there it is. Where do you think those earthquakes are coming from in that beautiful island? That's magma movement. <coughs> Isn't that cool? Yep. All righty. OK, so I'm going to um, leave layered earth. And no, I'm not going to save anything. Uh, if you're curious about some of the details, and I edited out all the swearing so that Mark would allow me to have my blog posted, uh, you can go to this site. And I have all kinds of stuff there about my sabbatical report and what worked and what didn't work. And, uh, I can tell you about early frustrations and difficulties that I, that I had. Uh, so for the most part, uh, I have lots of details there, kind of summarizing the different things that I used. And spring break is a very lonely time sometimes. A lot of faculty members just love leaving and going on field trips and doing fun things like that. But when you're on sabbatical and all the students leave, you feel kind of lost. It's really quiet. So I had a little fun in the museum. Uh, one time, and this kind of summarizes things a little bit. And that noise you're hearing is the ventilation system.
so we do have fun developing things. <laughs> uh, and it was spring break. Nobody was around. Uh, and this was done just for the sake of full disclosure with an iPhone clamped onto a stepladder over the touch table. <laughs> so if it sounds a little fuzzy and so forth and looks a little off, I can blame the projector partly for that, but also uh, the phone itself. It's very important to recognize that there are a number of people in here who have been, been really, really helpful with this whole thing. Their names are not listed up here because I didn't want to embarrass them. But if you're a museum docent, can you please stand up or have worked in the museum? Leah is one of the frontline people who, you know, I can write all kinds of stuff and talk about the museum and everything, but she's the first person, along with the other docents, that people often interact with. So they're the ones that get to play with it and blame me for when it doesn't work. Uh, so they get a lot of credit. We've got several docents we have over the, f the last few years, and we've ended up with about 7,000 uh, <coughs> museum visitors. So there are a lot of people who have seen the museum. Uh, so if you, if you haven't, uh, please come by and see uh, sometime. Again, I would like to thank Title V for providing uh, funding for the touch table. Uh, the sabbatical was just critical to getting all this done. The computing services guys were just phenomenal because this is just not an everyday sort of piece of equipment. If anybody wants to look under the cabinet later, we can. But uh, it was real interesting trying to get things to happen uh, with this touch table. And I have an awful lot of supportive colleagues out there. So thanks to all you guys for keeping me going. Uh, any questions at this point? Yes, Dr. Jones. Dr. Benson, do you intend to take photographs of each of its museum samples so that instead of going to an external website, when you click on the touch, the uh, touch the table for a sample that's in the museum, not only will it bring up the text, but also a picture of that sample? I have all those pictures. Now, the trick is you know, how you set up the links and so forth. And how many pictures do you think I have? A lot. <laughs> a lot. And so, I mean, there's a lot of work that is involved with that. But that technology is there. And for the sake of not keeping things, you know, just for the sake of demonstration purposes, I just went through things. But yes, that will happen. Yes, Nicole? Where does your data live and is any of it public? The data lives in there. <laughs> uh, and it's not public at this time. You know, that's something I would have to think about because one of the issues with public data uh, is that do I really want to broadcast our collection? Think about security. That's a possibility that, you know, that's something that people have mentioned to me. Uh, but at the same time, it would be cool if somebody could think, wow, Adams has one of these. Let's go by and visit. And I'll send my kids to school here. Uh, so, you know, that's, I don't have any plans for it. Right now it's residing. Uh, uh, specifically on the touch table, but th those are good suggestions. I don't, I, but I don't know quite how we can pull that off yet. Do you have some ideas? <laughs> okay, good. We'll talk later. <laughs> Other questions, folks? Gosh, I don't think I'm that good. Come on. <laughs> Either that or, or that bad, maybe. I don't know. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and tune in next semester for more faculty talks. <laughs>